So hi, my name is Rob Canzanari, and I'm with the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone today for coming to the uh, presentation that Ryan, a friend of mine, has agreed. You know, he's, he's talked before, and he's you know talking today on Always On. Um, we we record all the sessions, and we post them to YouTube, and you can get the links uh, via. Uh, SQL Path Virtual Chapter, which is the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter, or I have a blog. You, I, I like to post them there too to give people two or three options on how to get to the webinars uh, because um, we have a following. You're welcome to follow us on YouTube and watch our, you know, watch our sessions, and they're great sessions. The, the beauty is you don't have to be here right now. You can watch them at any time you want, and um, there's a lot of great contact out there with um, sessions that we've given in the past. Um, Let's go to the next page. So PASS has lots of data archi data chapters, virtual chapters, and here's some of them. And I just wanted to make you all aware that, you know, you can always sign up for an archi a different virtual chapter and see great webinars. And they're always given, you know, it's amazing, the free um, content out there to help you in your career and networking and get on with, uh, you know, different projects. And, and a lot of these people that give these uh, webinars actually will respond to emails when you have problems so you build up a network of help so it's a great it's really great that uh, PASS supports this and lets us have these uh, events so with that I'd like to welcome Ryan uh, to the data architecture virtual chapter and I'm gonna switch over to let him change the presenter to Ryan right now and let him take over from here All right, guys. <clears throat> see if I can share my webcam, and hopefully that will not uh, show up okay. All right, so let's get started today. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, go to the next slide here. Uh, my name is Ryan Adams, and I do uh, use Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, make sure you go out there and follow me. It's Ryan J. Adams on Twitter. Hey, Ryan. I am I'm yes. not seeing your um, I'm seeing your webcam great, but we're not seeing your screen for some reason. Hmm. All right, let's see here. It seems to be showing in the audience view. Ah, I got it now. I don't know what happened, but it came up. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if you did something or something. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, yeah, I had stopped presenting it. Let's see. Did that change things? Well, I you see like, about no me, um, and I see your web. Okay. It's like split screen, a little bit about yep. your web, and mostly the screen. So. Okay, perfect. Thank That's you. what we were shooting for. All right, if that happens again, let me know. Fine. All right. Uh, like I was saying, I am a SQL Server MVP. I do work for Verizon. I've worked for Verizon for uh, about 17 years now. I've done everything from desktop, server, Active Directory, and, of course, SQL Server. Uh, in, in the course of my career and uh, the group that I work with now we do a lot of identity management type work uh, making sure that you know people have got accounts uh, automatically provisioned and deprovisioned as they uh, come on board with the company or leave the company I believe I remember I always tell everybody I read a stat a couple years ago I believe the average person uh, that comes into a company's got about 23 accounts when they get hired on or by the time they leave the company uh, but only about five of them get disabled so that's something that we work really hard to make sure that we don't uh, uh, have that issue going on. Um, I'm also associated with Lynchpin and People, so if you are looking for any type of uh, outside consultancy type work, uh, let me know and we can get you hooked up with that. Uh, I will be speaking at the PASS Summit this year, so uh, if you're going to be in Seattle uh, at the summit, uh, if you haven't, uh, an amazing experience, definitely something to look into. I know that Rob's got a, uh, a code that you can use for, for as being a part of the virtual chapter here. It'll save you $150 off the registration. So make sure you take advantage of using that code. I'm pretty active in the SQL Server community. I live in Dallas, Texas, and I help run the user group down here. Um, I'm also the president of the Performance Virtual Chapter, uh, which shameless plug for the Virtual Chapter. If you haven't checked the Performance Chapter out yet, uh, we've got what we call the annual Performance Palooza. It's going on next Thursday, so one week and one day from today. Uh, where we've got eight back-to-back -back performance tuning sessions scheduled, uh, so that is also free, just like this chapter here, so take advantage of that. Here's what we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to try, as you know, we're, we're an architectural virtual chapter here, so what I want to try and do is just keep uh, our 
goals around designing an architecture here. And obviously, when we look at always on, it's going to be a high availability and disaster recovery. So that's where we're trying to make this fit. So we kind of want to keep an eye on that and think about that. Uh, where exactly is this going to fit? If I'm designing an HADR plan, you know, we want to use the right tool for the right job. This isn't going to be the best tool for every job. But hopefully at the end of today, once we've talked about this, this is just kind of an introductory session to get an understanding of what these feature sets are and what they can do for you, you at least have a better understanding of, you know what, this probably isn't the right solution for me, or you know what, this is a great solution, this is going to fit it. So hopefully you'll be able to make that determination by the end of today. So we're going to talk about just what the feature set actually is and what all is included in it. We'll talk about failover cluster instances, and then we'll talk about availability groups. We're also going to talk a good bit about server failover clustering, and I'm hoping to drive home the importance of failover clustering, the Windows server side of things. Because remember, we're building out an architecture here. This architecture contains a lot of different components, and making sure that we get it right is really, really important. And I hope when we talk about the Windows side of this architecture, it will become really apparent to you exactly how imperative that piece is to the overall workings of everything else that sits on top of it. Then we'll look at what uh, multi-database failover means. Uh, just avail and then we'll take a look at the availability replicas, uh, how those kind of fit into the architecture and how that works with the des overall design. And then as those replicas are considered to be secondaries, we'll look at how those are active and how we can actually use those, which is something in some of the other designs uh, for HA and DR is not something that we were able to do before, but it is something that is a, a really handy thing that we get now. So what is always on? Well, always on is a marketing term at the very top level. Uh, this is something that uh, Microsoft's marketing scheme decided to come up with, and that's what they decided to call it was always on. But always on as a marketing term actually contains two different specific uh, technologies here. And the first one is failover clustering. And, and a failover cluster instance, or you'll hear me use the word FCI for uh, our acronym, it's just the old SQL Server clustering. Now, I'm going to hopefully change your mindset on that a little bit because before we've always seen Windows clustering and SQL Server failover clustering is kind of one and the same. Well, as it turns out, they're not one and the same. It's only because they've been coupled together so close for so long. But as we start talking about availability groups and some of these other things, I'm hoping that we'll get a better understanding of Look, these are two completely separate technologies, but one of them sits on top of the other one. And so we've kind of got this basis underneath as we build and put other things on top of it, right? So we're, we've got the cake underneath. We're going to put different kinds of icing on top. So with that, let's talk about always on and what it can and can't do for you. Because again, we're trying to architect the right platform for the right problem. We're always trying to solve a business problem. And this isn't always going to solve the right one. We need to make the right choice. So if we look at the FCI, the biggest thing is what kind of protection it gives you. Well, it gives you server-level protection, and it gives you SQL Server protection. And what I mean by that is at the server level, this means I'm covered against hardware failure. That's the first piece. Um, if somebody comes into my data center, and he's being really clumsy, and he kicks a cable out, I'm going to be OK. If my backplane goes out and my backplane's not redundant, I'm going to be okay. And at the SQL Server level, we're talking about actual DLLs, right? So the actual engine itself is going to protect me against any corruption type issues there or any major issues that I would have uh, with the actual engine or operating system itself. Now, an availability group gets a little bit more granular, so we kind of come down a step and we're looking at just the database level itself. Okay, so it doesn't protect me against the server or SQL or any of that stuff. It's just at a database level protection. The other plus that it gives me is over uh, mirroring, and we're going to compare this a lot to mirroring because it's the quote-unquote replacement for mirroring. Uh, but there's some gotchas with that, and we'll talk about that. But what it really does is it abstracts my client connection. So as a client, when I connect to this, it abstracts that away. So instead of going directly to an individual server, it's more like an FCI where we've got a virtual network name. We connect to the virtual name, and it dynamically moves between whichever node is live. And I think that will become a little bit more clear as I use that terminology when we get a few more slides in and we start talking about availability groups. But just keep in mind that when you're designing this, choose the right one. Right, an FCI might be right for you, an AG might, right, might be right for you, maybe neither one of them is, 
but let's make sure we have a good understanding of things so we can make the right choice as we go. So let's talk about failover cluster instances first. So with an FCI, the first thing to understand is what is and is not covered by an FCI. Now, we get protection here at the database engine and analysis services. So both of those can be hosted in a failover cluster instance, and I'm talking about the actual services themselves. Now, reporting services, integration services, and the SQL browser service, none of those are supported inside of a cluster. Now, I need to be a little more specific here because I'm talking about the actual services themselves. Right? So the reporting services service cannot be clustered. But the databases, so right, report server, report server tempdb, those guys I can host inside of a cluster. Same with integration services, right? So databases we can throw in a cluster, but the integration services service itself is not something as of now that can actually be clustered uh, natively. So we don't have options for being resilient with the actual service itself. Now, the browser service is an interesting kind of a guy, and remember, for those of you not familiar with the browser service, what he does is he directs me to the right port that my SQL server is listening on. That's all he does. Now, if we're running a default instance, it doesn't really matter because the client's automatically going to default to 1433. He's going to try that first. But if it's a named instance, named instances don't run on default ports. They run on dynamic ports. They can change uh, with a server restart. They just restarting the SQL Server service itself can actually cause the port to change. It may not change, but it could change. It's kind of a toss-up whether that's going to happen or not. And so what this says is as a client, if I'm coming into the server and I don't know what port he's running on, I'm going to attempt 1433 first. If I get an answer, fantastic, life's great. But if I don't, then I'm going to talk over UDP 1434 which will talk to the browser service and say, hey, tell me what port SQL Server is running on. The browser service tells me the port number, and then as a client, I will reconnect directly to SQL Server on that port. Well, I don't really need that service to be clustered, and the reason I don't is because that service actually runs on every node in a cluster. Every server will be running that service. If that node's not active, then he's essentially just listening to dead air. No harm, no foul. Uh, but if he happens to be active, then he will behave exactly the way that he needs to behave. Yeah. So what does an FCI look like? So this is just a general architecture. So this is just a real basic diagram of how it could look. Now, we can have way more nodes than three, but we just wanted to keep it simple here. But we could have, uh, depending on your operating system, and I, I may be jumping ahead of myself a couple slides here, uh, with C, uh, Windows Server 2008, you could have up to 16 uh, in 2012, you could have up to 64 nodes pointing to it. Now, if you guys have been attending the architecture virtual chapter, and you've been talking about different architectures inside a SQL Server, when you look at this diagram, I'm hoping you look at this and go, okay, well, I got three nodes and I've got this sand. So these are my basic components. But the first thing I want to look at is, well, what happens if I look at this diagram? I want to analyze it immediately and go, look, is there any weak point here? And when I look at this, to me, the first thing that jumps out as a weak point is that all the arrows are pointing to the exact same place. They're pointing to the sand. That makes him a single point of failure, right? If that sand goes down or I lose connection to that sand and don't have multiple paths, a lot of different things that can go wrong, then it doesn't matter how many nodes I have. You can have 64 nodes. Congratulations, you just spent a bunch of money, and you're completely down with 64 servers that are technically running all because your SAN went down. So that's something you need to think about with an FCI is that is kind of the one weak point that it is. Now the plus side is it fails over really, really quickly, and I am the server is covered on the hardware side because every one of these nodes is a different server, could be physical, could be virtual, it's a different operating system, it's a different install of SQL Server, or different, not necessarily, not, so I don't want to say instance, I'm saying install because it is, uh, depending upon whether you're using an FCI, well we're talking about FCIs here, right, so you're basically installing the DLLs when you go through an add node wizard on the other one, so you're protected against that corruption as well. So because you have a full copy of this, if any one of these nodes fails, the other guy takes over immediately, 
and you're ready to go. You're back up and running, and it's a very fast failover. So that's a fantastic situation. So at least you're highly available here. So what's new with this? What new things got added? Because so far, if you're already familiar with FCIs, we've just talked about the architecture and the general design here. There's nothing really new that we've talked about. Now here's the new things that they've added. The first one's multi-site clustering, and this one's super cool. And this came out new in Windows Server 2008, so it's been out. Can you still hear me? Uh, barely can hear you. It's got a hum and um, just a, a, a slight hum. Okay. That's better. I accidentally, okay. Thank you. I accidentally uh, kicked out my cable for my headset, so that was awesome. Sorry about that, folks. So with multi-site clustering, uh, again, it came out in Windows 2008. Uh, they've made it much more robust and much better in Server 2012, but the idea is, is that out of all those nodes that we looked at, like those three nodes, before, they used to all have to be in the same subnet. Well, now they don't have to be. We could actually put one in a different data center in a completely different subnet, and we don't need to create VLANs. We don't need to do anything else. It's all taken care of there in the operating system. Now, I do want to caution you on, um, and sometimes it could be a little bit of a stickler on some of the terminology we've used, but I just want to make sure that you guys understand the terminology here. So I call it multi-subnet for a reason. There's two other terms that you will commonly hear if you go researching the internet, uh, listening to other speakers and things that talk about this stuff, is you're going to hear geo-clustering and you're going to hear multi-site clustering. All of those are synonymous. They all mean the exact same thing. However, if you hear the word geo-clustering or multi-site clustering, immediately in your mind, I want you to replace that with the word multi-subnet because that is the technical differentiator here. It's not necessarily the fact that it's in a different data center that makes this technology work. It's the fact that it's in a different subnet. It just so happens that if you're in a different data center, you're probably going to be in a different subnet with the exception of being in a VLAN. But you can have multiple subnets in a single data center. So it's not the fact that they are in two different parts of the country or two different parts of the world that is the differentiating factor here. It's not physical location. Okay, So just remember that from a technological standpoint, think multi-subnet every time you hear one of those other two terms, that's the differentiator. Now, if you're going to do this with a failover cluster, for instance, remember we haven't got availability groups yet, we're just talking FCIs, you would have to replicate the storage across from one data center to another. I'm not a SAN expert, I'm not a super awesome SAN guy, but what I do know is that that is an add-on to most SANs to get that uh, particular functionality, and it's usually one of the more expensive ones. It's not a cheap solution overall. Now, what made all of this magic happen since Windows Server 2008 when they released it is an OR clause, and I'm not going to be able to show you an install and demo of everything we're talking about today, but I'm going to show you what an environment looks like, and I'll show you where that OR clause is. But the idea is, is that you know when I attach to a cluster like this, I only want one IP address. There's one guy to shoot, right? But he's going to be live and move between nodes automatically. And what the OR does is they'll have more than one IP address attached to that network name. And you can say, you can use this IP or this IP or this IP. It depends on which one is valid for that network that that node happens to be on. And that's the magic that we use. Before, it used to be an AND when we used to build that out, but they've added the OR clause, which is kind of the magic behind the scenes. And of course, like I say, you're going to have multiple IP addresses attached to that, so you'll need to register those in DNS as well. Next new thing they added was TempDB doesn't have to be on shared storage anymore. So they finally started thinking about it and go, you know what, what, has happened? what happens to TempDB when SQL Server restarts? Well, it gets completely recreated, right? The old TempDB goes away, when SQL Server starts up, we just we blow the old TempDB away and it creates a whole brand new one. Well, if it's creating a new TempDB every time SQL Server restarts, which is exactly what happens when it fails over from one node to another, well, do we really need to have it on shared storage? Does it need to be available and accessed from every individual node like we saw in that diagram? Well, of course not. So we could put it on local storage. So it can be on the D drive on every single node because when we fell over from one node to the other, we just recreated it off we go. But the advantage to that 
is that that storage is going to be faster than sand storage. So if you are having any tempdb contention, then this can help alleviate this. Now I will tell you that this doesn't mean you shouldn't troubleshoot tempdb contention like you normally would. You still need to do that. But this is another tool in the toolbox that might help you to alleviate that contention even further by increasing that I.O. speed. Now, install-wise, what is a little weird here that I'll warn you against is that when you first go and you create your very first node, it will create the directory for you on your local drive, and it will grant the proper permissions to it for you. It won't do that on any node other than the second node. So when you go over to the second node and you go to add that node in, the install will not warn you a second time. It won't go, oh, hey, by the way, I see that you put TempDB on local storage on the first node, so go make sure you create this, or even better yet, I'll create it for you. Now, if you go to connect.microsoft.com, search around, I open a connect item on this. So if you think that is not an overly user-friendly behavior, feel free to promote that up on connect. Uh, and hopefully Microsoft will add that feature in, but just want you to be aware of that because what happens is if you forget to create that directory structure on the second node or the third node or whatever node it is, when you fail over to that node and that directory structure doesn't exist anymore, SQL Server can't start. If it can't create TempDB, if it cannot create TempDB, it won't start. Well, guess what? That's a pretty bad user experience. So that's something that you've got to remember to do, so don't forget that, okay? Flexible failover policy. Uh, if you're already familiar with uh, clustering, you'll know that there's a heartbeat, and the heartbeat is a pinging between the nodes because everybody needs to figure out whether the other nodes are up or not. That way, if one node goes down, he stops responding to my pings, I know he's down, and then I'm going to fail over and become active. Fantastic. Well, the old method of doing that was what we call looks alive and it is alive. Now, looks alive would just literally do a ping. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've actually seen an operating system go to a blue screen and still respond to a ping. That doesn't really tell me a whole lot. It doesn't necessarily tell me the operating system is running. It doesn't really tell me whether SQL Server, the engine itself is running, and it most certainly doesn't get specific enough to tell me that database number four is okay. So then I took it a step further, and I said, well, in addition to that, we're going to do an is alive check, and it literally queries SQL Server, does a select at at server name is what it's doing. Well, great. If I get a response back from that, that means the operating system's got to be up and running. And it means the SQL Server has got to be up and running. So that's a plus. But it doesn't really get down to the database level and tell me you know, that a specific database is okay. And that's where the flexible failover policy comes in. So what they've done is they've added this detection level. Now there's a, a system stored proc called SP server underscore diagnostics. Now you don't need to be running an FCI or an availability group. You could be running a standalone SQL server instance and you could actually go query that yourself if you want. Um, it's already there uh, ready for you to use in the background. Uh, obviously if you're not running an FCI, you're not going to get the kind of information back, but you can go run that yourself if you're curious to see what's there. And it will come back with uh, six different levels, zero through five. And you can go look this up on your own. I, I don't have time to show you this, but um, it's anywhere from the SQL Server services down to something specific like my worker threads are exhausted. So we can say, look, if the worker threads are exhausted, go ahead and fail over. Um, so we can get a little more specific so that it's more than just a ping and more than just a query of select that at server name. So a lot more functionality for us there. So always on availability groups. So take failover cluster instances, shove that out of your mind for now. We're not talking about that anymore. We're just talking about availability groups now. Okay. So completely change of mindset here. Now with an availability group, what's really cool about this is it's really just a logical structure that I am allowed to take and put around and encompass around my databases to put them in this group, this logical structure of a group. And there's some cool things about doing that that we'll talk about. One of which is, when I put them in a group, I'm saying these guys are best friends to the end. If one of them fails, they're all going to support each other and they're all going to fail over and stick together, which is great because if I have an application that requires five, six, seven databases in order to run, well, if I was using mirroring before and one of them failed over, then one of them's over here, the other four or five are sitting on this box, the application doesn't can't work like that if we're on two different boxes. So now what it does is, is look, we're putting them all together in a group. If one of them fails, 
they all come over together, and then your application is good to go again. So, I, you know, my last bullet point here says that it's mirroring redefined, and that's essentially what an availability group is, is we're doing mirroring, it's kind of like the new hotness of mirroring, right? But there are some gotchas, we'll talk about that. So, first thing up is requirements. Is with everything, there's always a few requirements. Now, we need to be running Windows Server 2008 or later in order to run availability groups. I highly suggest that you run 2012 R2. There is a ton of updates and patches that are required to run it on 08 and 08 R2, and it has been known to be extremely problematic. So it's highly suggested that you run an availability group on Windows 2012 R2. Uh, you need to be running SQL Server 2012 Enterprise Edition. That was when the uh, 2012 was when this feature got introduced, and it is an enterprise-only edition feature. That is one drawback with mirroring. Mirroring, you could get away with uh, doing mirroring in asynchronous mode with uh, just standard edition, and unfortunately, uh, that's not the case with availability groups. There is definitely a cost factor involved in jumping to enterprise. You do need a Windows Server failover cluster. Let me say that again. You need a Windows Server failover cluster. You do not need a SQL Server failover cluster instance to have an availability group. They are completely two different things but you do need the Windows operating system needs to be clustered. That is the basis, that's the cake, the base bottom point. Don't put it on a domain controller, just don't do it, trust me. I've done Active Directory, you don't want to do that. You can only do user databases just like mirroring, so master model MSDB, you can't include any of those guys in this architecture. Databases need to be in a full recovery model. As soon as I say full recovery model, you should have a red flag in your head that goes off that says you should be doing log backups. Not just full backups, specifically, you need to be doing unequivocally transaction log backups are a must and a requirement for any database in full recovery model. Because an availability group requires them to be in full recovery model, you absolutely need to be doing log backups. What's not required? Well, like I said, I don't need a SQL failover cluster instance. I just need Windows to be clustered. The other plus here is I don't need shared storage. So remember with the diagram back at the very beginning where we had the three nodes and they were all pointing to the SAN, that shared storage piece, that single point of failure? We don't need that anymore with, fail, with an availability group. So that single point of failure is gone now. That's one huge advantage to an availability group. Few prerequisites on the database side. Again, full recovery model required. You need to have taken a full backup of the database and a log backup of the database prior to creating your availability group. Also, every one of those backups has to be restored on every single node. So if you've got an availability group with four or five nodes, you're going to have to back up every database, which there could be however many you have, 6, 7, 10, 15, 20, whatever the number is. You've got to back them all up with a full backup. You've got to back the log up, and then you've got to go restore it on four, five, however many nodes you happen to have in your availability group. So that's something that you want to be able to script out. You want to use a third-party product, whatever you're using in order to handle automatically backing that up and getting that restored multiple times for every instance. Uh, and of course you can do that using SQL command is a good way to do that natively. Uh, you can do that with PowerShell as well of course. When you do restore it, you need to make sure you're restoring even the very last transaction log backup needs to be done as a restore database with no recovery. So you have to use the with no recovery clause. You cannot have the database fully recovered on the secondaries. So again, the Windows Server failover cluster is kind of that base layer. You have to have that for an availability group. Now, it's going to be mutually exclusive from a failover cluster instance. So although you can have a failover cluster instance as part of the architecture and put it in an availability group, it is not a requirement. Okay, So they're, an FCI and an AG are mutually exclusive to each other, but you can use them together if you so choose. So why do I need this failover cluster instance? Because it kind of seems like that's a little bit of a drawback. And it's 
depends on how you look at it, and there really isn't a drawback here. There's only really one major drawback, and that's the fact that everything has to be in a domain. Um, but otherwise, there's really no drawback here. But what it does give me is it gives me quorum. Well, quorum's a great thing because that is the decision-making process, the voting mechanism that decides whether I'm up or down. So let me say that again because I really want you to understand the point here. Quorum decides whether you are up or down. Quorum is part of the Windows Server fail over cluster. To take it further, what decides whether SQL Server is up or down is not SQL Server. SQL Server is not calling the shots here. The Windows cluster is calling the shots using this Quorum model. It decides whether SQL Server needs to be failed over and whether it's up or down. Now, SQL Server has some input because it's querying the, the, the cluster is querying the SP Server diagnostics that we talked about earlier in order to get that one through five level back and making its failover decision based on that. So SQL Server's got some input here, but the ultimate call when it boils down to the end of the day is the cluster on the Windows side. So I've always been a big proponent of no matter what you're sitting on top of, no matter what architecture, how crazy it is, however many pieces you have running, if you're sitting on VMware, if you're sitting on side of a cluster, uh, you're sitting on side of a SAN, you don't need to be an expert on those things, but if you're a DBA and you've got SQL Server sitting on one of those guys, you need to know something, at least the very basics about those pieces of hardware or software that you're sitting on top of. And it couldn't be any more true, and I can't drive that home any more than I could now with Windows clustering because it's calling the shots. So you need to make sure that you have a good basic understanding of what's going on. It also abstracts the IP and network names. So remember, I told you we've got multiple nodes. Well, if I'm connecting to node one and it fails over to node two, well, then I have to re change my connection string and repoint to node two. I don't want to have to do that. I want it to be seamless. So what this does is it gives me a network name and IP address that dynamically moves from node to node on whichever one is active at any given point in time. Cool part about that, I don't need to change connection strings. I don't need to alter my app. I don't need to tell my users to, to point to a different place. I don't need to make DNS changes and aliases and move that stuff and wait for DNS replication to occur. Cluster handles all of that for me. It's a wonderful thing. So here's an example of an availability group architecture. Now, I have, I have stolen this from books online, uh, and the link for it is down there at the bottom, so you can go back and, uh, you know, you can go to my uh, blog and pull down this slide deck. It's there now uh, at ryanjadams.com. If you click on presentations at the top, you can pull it down. Also give it to Rob so that he can post that along with the recording uh, if he wants to do that. But this architecture, you can go look this up at books online, and what this is is this is a full-blown architecture for an availability group based on SQL Server 2012. The reason I'm saying SQL Server 2012 is because the five nodes you see here is the maximum limit that we can have in SQL Server 2012. SQL Server 2012 allows us to have one primary, which is always your read-write replica. All the other nodes are secondary, so you can have up to four secondary nodes, which of course gives me a total of five. Now, looking at this schematic here, if I were to take a look at the five nodes here, the one thing I'm going to notice that's different over an FCI is the yellow box. The yellow boxes on every one of these nodes says that I have a standalone instance of SQL Server installed on it. So I have actually installed in this architecture SQL Server five times, and I did it as a standalone instance instance because they are completely separate instances of SQL Server. Now the nodes themselves on the operating system, they are clustered together at the Windows level. Okay, So bottom level, Windows is clustered together. Individual, we've got SQL Server installed on every node. And then my availability group is the guy in the middle that sits across every one of those instances of SQL Server, which we would call a replica. Now, the availability group, I'm showing three databases in it. It could have more, it could have less, it could have one. It doesn't really matter. That's up to you. The decision, though, is if you have an app that supports the need or requires more than one database, they do want do need to be an availability group because you want them to stick together as they fail over. 
So we talked a lot about uh, mirroring here. So I want to kind of compare this to mirroring and the differences between the two because a lot of it really sounds extremely similar about how they react uh, as far at an architecture type level, how they replicate, how they talk, how they work, and that kind of stuff. The only difference is, is we've kind of thrown this whole Windows cluster thing into the mix of a mirror. That's essentially what we've done here. We've taken the best parts of a failover cluster instance and the best parts of mirroring, put those two together, and bam, we came out when they got married, we came out with this power couple that can handle all of those wonderful things all together in one solution. So, first thing we get, we had this with mirroring, we still maintain this now, is automatic page recovery. Now, what this means is, is that if I have a data page that happens to go bad on any replica of any of the five, it will go to another replica, it's going to grab that data page and automatically replace the bad one with a good one. It does this seamlessly in the background. Mirroring, if you didn't know, also did that as well. So that piece is actually not new. We still retain that, uh, which is really cool. Now, you can track that. There is a DMV that you can query to figure out how many auto page repairs have occurred. And it's something you do want to keep an eye on because if you start seeing a trend where it's occurring more and more frequently, there's an excellent chance you need to start go digging into your IO subsystem. Something's not going right underneath the hood. And you need to be proactive and check on that before bad things happen and go talk to your sand guy, physical drives, whatever. Compression. Network guys love us because we're taking up less space. We've compressed it, which also means that higher transaction levels, we can press and put more stuff over the wire at any given time. Security guys love you because everything's encrypted over the wire that's getting sent between all the replicas. Had all that stuff in mirroring, still have that with availability groups. Here's what goes away though. With mirroring, if we had an automatic failover from one partner to the next partner, from our primary over to our mirror, or what we used to call the principal over to the mirror and mirroring, we used to have to alter our connection string. We used to put something in there called failover partner. And what that said to the client was, if I try to go connect to the primary and I don't get a response, then whatever this failover partner is, I need to go talk to him and automatically start talking to him. Well, we don't need him anymore. Well, why not? Because I'm still failing over from one node to another, so shouldn't I have a failover partner in availability group that also says, hey, look, if I, this dude stops responding to me, I need to go talk to his best friend over here, the other replica, in order to start getting my answers back. Well, no, you don't, and the reason is because we have the virtual network name. It's also called the listener. You call it a virtual network name inside of Windows. They call it a listener inside of SQL Server. It's the same thing. Remember, that's that abstraction point. That's that single network name that moves dynamically and automatically for us. We don't need failover partner anymore because the Windows Server cluster takes care of it. We used to have a witness, and that's what allowed us to have automatic failover. We don't need it anymore either. Why do we not need it anymore? Because of quorum. The Windows Server cluster is also taking care of that. The witness just provided a quote-unquote quorum he helped make the decision of when to fail over or not. But with a cluster, clustering and quorum inside the cluster, now OS handles that for us now. It's a much more elegant and more beautiful design for sure. So what's new? Obviously there had to be some new cool stuff, right? We didn't do this just for the fun of it, and Microsoft didn't make this up to not be a selling point, right? Well, multiple database failovers, so like we talked about already, it allows me to take my databases, put them in the logical construct and availability group. If one of them fails, they all follow along and they go together. Replicas, every, one, every instance of SQL Server on every one of those OSs that we looked at in that architecture design, we had five of them, every single one of those is considered a replica. Now, every one of those instances can only house one replica for an AG. So if an availability group uh, is part of a replica, I can only have one of those. Each instance, however, can house more than one replica for multiple availability groups. So you can't have a database and have multiple copies of him uh, inside of any particular one replica. Uh, you also can't get around that if you were thinking, well, I can take this database, I want two copies of it on the replica, so I'm going to create two availability groups and add the same database to more than one AG. Microsoft was one step ahead of you. They thought of that. You can't do that. As soon as you try to add it, that's a big, fat no. Can't do that. 
Now, differences between 2012 and 2014. You get five total replicas in SQL Server 2012. One primary, which is your read, your read write copy. It's the only one that you can actually do writes to. And then the four secondaries. And we haven't really gotten to this, but I've alluded to it multiple times, is that those secondaries, you can read off of those. You couldn't do that with mirroring. So that's pretty awesome. Now 2014, they added the secondaries went from four to eight. So it gives you a total of nine. You've got one read write and you've got eight secondaries. Um, in 2016, there is some new cool stuff coming. That I can't tell you about yet, but I can tell you that as far as the replicas, uh, that is not something that they have actually changed yet. So there's there's not going to be an increase in replicas yet. Um, if you are curious about that, obviously SQL Server uh, 2016, the CTP is available. If you've got access to Azure, you can go spin one up in less than 10 minutes uh, in Azure and play around with it, or you can download the CTP. Anybody can do that now today. Replica synchronization modes. There's two modes that we've got. First of all is synchronous. Synchronous means no data loss. Everybody wants no data loss. It sounds awesome. But the kicker to it is, is there is a possibility we could get some latency on the primary because we have to wait for the secondary to confirm that he got it back before we actually commit it. Uh, only two replicas in an availability group can be in synchronous mode at any one time. So keep that in mind. Now here's how synchronous mode works. So starting at the top, we're on our primary, and the transaction is going to get inserted to the log. We're going to read it out of the log, and then we're going to ship that guy over to the replica. Now the replica is going to take that as his own transaction, write it to his log, and he's going to commit it. And then he'll send the acknowledgment back to the primary that says, hey, I got it. You're good to go. Once we receive the acknowledgment back, the very last section down there, at the primary, then he commits it. But what I want you to think about here is that the original transaction that occurred at the top of the primary doesn't get committed until you get all the way down here to the bottom. So the transaction is actually being held open for longer than it needs to be on, like it would be on a standalone box, because I can't close it out until I get that commit back on that very last replica. And this can get exponentially more complicated because we're not just talking from one server to another. You could have up to eight secondaries in 2014. You are only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So if you're super fast on the first four replicas and number five sitting over there in Timbuktu on some super crappy dial-up DSL type network, guess what? You're waiting for that dude to respond. So you're holding your transactions open, which can increase things like locking and blocking while you're waiting for that guy to do a little catching up. Now, flip side of this story is asynchronous. So we're not going to have any, we're going to have a, there's a little bit of a risk involved here. There is a possibility of data loss, but that whole latency situation goes away completely because we're not waiting anymore. Now, up to four replicas in availability group can use async, and up to eight can use asynchronous in 2014, depending upon which version you're using, which basically means you don't have to have a synchronous. They could all be async. That would be the max number that we're looking at here. Here's how it works. Transaction is going to get inserted in the log. We're going to read it from the log, but we're going to commit it on the primary immediately. We're not waiting for the secondaries to come back and say they got it. Then the secondary, we're going to ship it out. The secondary is going to do his normal stuff. He's going to write it. He's going to commit it. Now, he still sends an acknowledgment back to the primary because what I really want to know when it comes to troubleshooting this is exactly how far behind is this, right? Because there's a possibility of data loss here. The further behind he is, the greater amount of data I am risking to lose, something that you'd want to monitor. Now, failover modes. We've got a couple here. Uh, automatic. Now, automatic means no data loss, and the reason it does is because, well, if you want automatic failover, they're requiring you to be in synchronous mode, and synchronous means no data loss. Uh, automatic failover does need to be enabled, so interestingly enough, a lot of people for some reason think that because synchronous means no data loss, they think that it goes together in their minds. I'm not, I'm not sure if this, this thought process came from mirroring probably, I think, where they go, oh, if I put it in you know, uh, synchronous mode, then I'm going to get automatic failover. And as it turns out with availability group, there's an extra checkbox after you put it in synchronous mode uh, to put it in automatic failover mode. Only two of them can be in uh, automatic failover mode. Okay, hey, so you can have up to. Yeah. 
I got a great question here if you have a minute or sure yeah shoot so, um for synchronous mode it ships the replica let me read it is it shipped to the replica before it's flushed to the disk um he is wondering if it immediately transfer the log records are they written to the log buffer or does it wait for them to be flushed to disk um, so it actually waits for them to be written to the transaction log. So they don't um, to be to be hardened in SQL Server. It just means that it's come out of the buffer cache enough to have hidden the transaction log, but it hasn't actually been hardened down to the data file yet. It doesn't wait for the data file uh, simply because if you think about uh, SQL Server, just how it works with transactions and how it commits everything, right? You know, it's first in, first last as far as memory goes. So we're going to hit memory. We're going to hit the buffer cache first. It's going to write everything to a transaction log in order to maintain our asset properties. That way, if SQL Server fails, it goes through cache recovery, right? So uh, any transactions that weren't committed, we're going to roll them back. Any that were, we're going to roll forward. That's essentially what's happening here. So it does have to be written down to the log so that at least the transaction itself is written down, but the data hasn't necessarily been pushed down to the data file yet. Thank you. You betcha. All right, so let's see. I think we already covered this slide here. Uh, if we're doing manual, uh, this is – if you are putting a failover cluster inside of an availability group, this is your only shot. You cannot do automatic failover if you decide to combine the two features. Now, keep in mind, they're completely different features. They can be installed separately. They can be done together. But if you combine them in FCI and you put it inside of an AG, you lose automatic failover. It's a little bit more complicated to support this uh, architecture by doing that as well. Uh, so obviously if you're doing manual, there, it can either be a planned situation or an unplanned situation. So if it's planned, I meaning you're doing it on purpose, uh, maybe I'm doing patching and I'm going to go fail over intentionally, it cannot be asynchronous, nor would you want it to be. If I'm failing over on purpose, why would I want to risk data loss, right? So I need to make sure I'm in sync mode. So there's no data loss, and then everything is, has to be in a synchronized state prior to me actually doing the failover. Now, if it's forced, that means it was unplanned, something bad happened, something I probably didn't plan on happening. But that's the whole reason we create this architecture to begin with is because the design is such that we will be protected against a failure like this. But there is possibility of some data loss in this situation. But again, it's better than losing everything, right? That's the whole reason we have this is that we can fail over to another node, and then that node will become live and will be ready to go again. Uh, but there's that possibility. So active secondaries, uh, we have readable replicas. So again, all those secondaries are readable. Now we can use that for reporting, and what's really cool about it is it's, we can use this for real-time reporting. So you could set up a reporting services server. Uh, you could actually point him to one of the secondaries. I designate that secondary to be used as being readable, and when you do that, uh, that means that all of your reporting workload I.O., you just took that off of your primary and put that onto a secondary and relieved it of that much I.O., and it will be in real time. So that's fantastic, right? We all rejoice. That's a wonderful solution to uh, real-time reporting. We can also take backups off of secondaries. And you can take DBCC consistency checks. You can do all of that off of a secondary. Now, that means that I can take all of the I.O. of all three of those and remove that I.O. off of the primary and put it on the secondary. Now, that is a really rosy rainbow type picture that sounds like this beautiful, amazing thing. Um, and that's the picture that has been painted here. However, I will tell you that in a real world environment, it doesn't really translate that well. Uh, the reason it doesn't is, let's talk about uh, DBCCs first. And remember that it's a different install of SQL Server on every single one of these nodes, which means they're on different servers with a different I.O. subsystem. So if I do a DBCC to do a consistency check on node 2, that tells me that the data is good from a logical standpoint and a physical standpoint on server 2 and its I.O. subsystem. That doesn't tell me anything about the primary. He could have it. He has a different hardware, different drives. Something could be going on different and bad over there that I need to know about. So should I offload all my DBCCs to a secondary and only a secondary? Me personally, no way. I do DBCCs on all of mine, and that's why. Because it sounds great at first, but when you really stop to think about it, mm, not so awesome. 
backups. Um, don't have enough time to get into that today, but it's complicated. One of the big things is you can't take a differential off of a secondary. If you want to do differentials, you need to do it off the primary. So these are all things to think about uh, as we look at designing this stuff. Active secondary gotchas. Snapshot isolation mode is going to be used here. Uh, need to be aware of that. That's how they make these things readable. Uh, you can't use separate indexes from your primary. So the first thought is, well, if I'm going to have a reporting workload with real-time reporting off of that, that's a completely different workload than my production workload. So what I really like to do is just separate that workload, create different indexes to support it. That would be awesome. Well, that's not something that we can do. Now, you can create an index on the primary that will support your reporting workload, but you have to create it on the primary and then it's going to get replicated down to all of your secondaries. Now, you're playing with fire there and that's something that you need to check on because after you create that index, depending upon the optimizer and the plan that the, the query optimizer chooses as its best, most optimal plan, what if on your primary it decided that for one weird reason, that that index that you created to support your work, your reporting workload, all of a sudden, last month it wasn't going to work, but now all of a sudden, it's a really good plan, and it starts using that index. And maybe you don't want it to. You want it to use the old one. So you need to think about those things, that although you can do that and add them, it could alter what's happening on either side. Now, statistics, on the other hand, those are actually stored separately. So statistics are different on every node. Uh, there is a separate set of statistics that are created on your secondary read-only nodes, and those are stored in tempdb, which also means that you probably need to plan for that tempdb uh, I.O. overhead because all those statistics are now getting stored in tempdb. Tempdb is getting a little more action than it used to. So we need to be certainly aware of that and make sure that we're keeping an eye on tempdb and kind of plan ahead for that. Also, it means that if those statistics are stored in tempdb, what happens to tempdb when SQL Server gets restarted? it gets wiped out and recreated, which means we're having to recreate those statistics all over again, which means that after a restart on a secondary, I could be getting suboptimal plans out of the query optimizer until those statistics are refreshed. Um, as we set this up, when we set the connection type of how clients are allowed to connect to me if I'm a secondary, we've got three choices. And it's called the read intent setting when you set up an availability group. And we can say no, which means there may be instances where, you know, if I report, if I point reporting services for my reporting workload to node three, I might not want users or my developers to have read-only access to that. So maybe I say, look, I don't want anybody to read from this. Or maybe it's a disaster recovery, right? So maybe this node is in my DR center in a different data center, and I don't want anybody to touch that guy because he's only there for DR. I can set him for no. If I set it for yes, it means, hey, anybody can read from me. That's not a problem. Anybody that comes in and talks to me, boom, you're in. No problem. I'll let you read. The third one's read intent. And what that means is that when I connect, I have to add something to my connection string, and it's called application intent equals read only, which means that my intention is to use this as a read only connection. That's the whole point of me connecting. Now, the good news is that might be something you want to use for your reporting services box. That way, if users try to connect to it, they won't be able to unless they have that in the connection string. So it's not a security thing, but it's kind of an obfuscation type thing, right? Where I really only want my reporting services to be dedicated to that and nobody else to read from him. But all it takes is your users to do one Google search to figure out, bam, all I need to do is add that one little line to my connection string and I'm in. So you can kind of obfuscate it there, but it's, it's not a full win-win. Availability group listener, not much to add here. We've already talked about him. We've called him a listener. We've called him a virtual network name, right? So that is a single network name that we're going to connect to that dynamically gets moved from one node to another, whichever happens to be active at any given time. It's something that you can see inside SQL Server, and it's something you can see inside the Windows uh, Server Cluster Manager. So you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to look at this architecture, is this the right choice for me? I'm thinking about high availability. I'm thinking about disaster recovery. Maybe this can solve HA for me. Maybe it can solve DR for me. Maybe it can do both. So it kind of depends whether we're looking at an FCI, whether we're looking at an AG. And we've got to look at all these factors and figure out which one. And as an architect, right, we need to decide which one choice is the right one 
in order to solve my business problems. So think of these questions. Can you support the Windows cluster? Because it's required for both an FCI and an AAG. It's not the easiest thing to manage on the face of the planet. Is this something that you're confident your Windows guys can handle? Is this something that you know enough about to at least ask them the right questions when you start having trouble? What about Active Directory? It is a requirement. You have to be in the same domain, so you can't cross domains. You can't be in a DMZ. You can't do those types of scenarios across firewalls. Also, do you have the right access into Active Directory, the requirements, the, the permissions that you need? Uh, do you need HA? Do you need DR? Or do you need both? Uh, is this going to be a multi-subnet cluster? So if you're not looking at DR, you probably don't need a, a multi-subnet cluster. Uh, Real-time reporting, is that something you need? Maybe, maybe not. If you don't need that, then maybe availability groups aren't the right choice for you. Maybe an FCI is not the right choice. Maybe you want to go look at mirroring or, or log shipping. Do you need multiple database failover? If you don't need that, one of the other HADR options might be better. And make sure that you meet your operating system and addition requirements, right? So what I'm talking about there is licensing and expense and all that kind of stuff. Make sure you research that. You don't want to get yourself into like, you know, surprise or some sticker shot going on here. I designed this whole thing. I submitted it. I went to finance and they looked what it was going to cost and went, holy smokes. You just went and upped the version of SQL Server and the operating system. You went to know which caused you to go for per core licensing and caused you to go to, to Cal licensing and all that kind of stuff. So think about those things as you're making these choices. So we're here at the top of the hour. I've just got two minutes left to the top of the hour, so we're pretty on time here. And this is the summary. I'm not going to go over the summary. You, we just talked about all this stuff. I don't need to rehash it. Um, but I do blog on this stuff, so you can catch me on my blog, ryanjadams.com. Again, if you're on Twitter, I encourage you to go follow me, Ryan J. Adams on Twitter. Of course, you can email me anytime. Uh, if you're looking for help and support, shoot me an email with this. Uh, again, I'm associated with Lynchpin, so we can uh, get you some resources there. And um, what I do want to do here just at the very end is I want to at least show you what one of these architectures looks like uh, as it's up and running. And it looks like my domain controller crashed on me. That's awesome. Let me uh, restart that guy and let him do his thing, but I think we'll be able to at least get in here and take a peek at what's going on anyway. So we're going to go into node one, and this is the exact type of setup we had talked about earlier where I've got a five node cluster here, and I just want to give you a quick peek into what we're looking at. Now this is Windows Server Failover Cluster Manager. If I look at my nodes, I can see that I do indeed have five nodes. Now unfortunately, uh, something uh, wacky went down with my uh, node five here, so node five happens to be down right now. He's kind of not running, not feeling so great today. Uh, but he's down, but I do have a five node cluster running here. And if I were to look at it, uh, what's interesting about this is um, I'll see some of these networks are down, and the reason they are is because of node five. Um, but I've actually got them in different subnets. So node five is actually in a completely different subnet. I can see that I'm in the 192, 168 range here, it is going to be my range for servers one through four. But if I were to go over and look at number five, he's in the 172.17 range. So you can see that I can have nodes all in the same cluster but are in completely different subnets. That's pretty cool. If I look at my roles here, I'll see that I've got two. Now this first guy I'm looking at right here is SQL Server inst01, right? Oops, I was shooting for a box out of that guy. He is a failover cluster instance. So when you look at a failover cluster instance, these are the typical resources that we'll see, and again, he's server fives down, so sorry about that, but other than the red arrows, everything's going to look identical other than the fact that it not being green, is you're going to see, look, I've got some disks associated with this because an FCI requires shared storage, and so I've got some disk resources in here. I've got my network name, and I've got my IP address that's associated with that, and then I've got SQL Server itself, and I've got the SQL Server agent. That's what I'm typically going to see for an FCI, but an availability group doesn't quite look that way. All he has is a network name. He's got two IPs. Now, that looks a little different, and the reason that does is because, well, I've got two IPs, and that's not what I would normally see, but that's because this is a multi-subnet failover cluster. So the cluster's got multiple subnets, and I'll see that I've got IPs in both of those ranges. So if I were to fail over to node 5, 
then that 10001 would go down, he'd go offline, and the 172.16.0.11 would come online as green as I were to fail over from one submit to another. So availability groups, not a whole lot to look at inside the failover cluster manager at first glance. Now, inside SQL Server, things look a little bit different. And I just want to show you the availability group. If I go look at my AG here, and let me go look, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. when I connect to this, we'll see what he looks like inside of SQL Server. So the first thing, this looks kind of like mirroring, where I look at my databases and it says, oh, they're all in a synchronized state. That's good news. Love to see everything synchronized. If I go under always on high availability under here, this is where all the, the uh, always on AG stuff sits. Here's that listener. Hey, look at that. App1 AG is what he's called. But sure enough, if you look over here, haha, -ha, App1 AG, when you create a listener, the listener SQL Server comes over here and creates App1 AG name and IP address inside the Windows cluster. It does that for you. I can see what databases are inside of this group. I've got three of them. And then I can take a look at my nodes. I can even open the, this handy dashboard here just to see the current state of all my nodes. And it's almost kind of good that node 5 is down because it lets you at least see what an error state would look like. But it lets me know right off the bat here at the top, from a node level, I can clearly see that I'm good to go. Everything's green from node 1, 2, 4. Server 5, he's not looking so great. I can see things like, what's my failover mode? These two are in automatic. I can see that these are probably going to be in synchronous mode, whereas these say synchronizing, so they're going to be in asynchronous mode. So I get a quick snapshot of what's going on, and it lets me drill down even further down here, where I can actually take a look at what is the state of every database from the perspective of node 1. And here's what they look like on node 2, and of course node 5 things are not looking so awesome right now. So obviously he didn't have enough time to uh, go and deploy one of these. I've actually got a whole other different presentation that we may take a look at doing sometime in the future that talks about this. I've got some on Windows clustering. Uh, we might be able to take a look at those in the future, uh, depending upon Rob's availability, and kind of dig into the back end of exactly how this stuff works and how to set it up properly. But I want to at least kind of give you a picture of just what it looks like on the on the very surface. So that's kind of what you're looking at for an FCI and an AG, and that's what those look like. Uh, so with that, um, I'll at least just throw my contact slide back up here. I'm done. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions here at the end. Um, we we actually have around? a few questions, and um, since you have some time, uh, I'll go ahead and throw them at you. Um, first one, let me get back to it, was um, an interesting, what I thought was kind of interesting, was that um, basically you have two computers running a default instance on both. And let's see, can these, co and, and those are the ones running the availability group uh, software with clustering. And can you put more instances on those computers? I don't know why you couldn't, but I'll get your input, you know, as secondary or third instances. Right. So you absolutely can. Um, you can do that. Uh, but the things you need to keep in mind is if you do that, it's the same as putting multiple instances on any instance of SQL Server is. Am I setting things like max server memory so that they're not going to step on each other? Maybe lock pages in memory, something I should probably be taking a look at at that point uh, in order to make sure that they're not stepping on each other. But you can absolutely do that. And um, another person wrote, let's see. Let me see if I can. Uh, does it also apply? I need the browser. They're talking about the, the DBCs check DB. Um, if they restore the production database to a test server, they kind of wanted to get your input when they run DVCC check DB on the um, test database. Um, your feelings on that because um, you were mentioning earlier about not running check DB based on the hardware or the architecture underneath the covers for mo the you know the secondary and third area replicas, and you felt better, which I do too, actually running it on all of them. Yeah, and honestly, it's the same thing here, right? It's the same idea. Now, I mean, you can do that. It's really common to go do the restore on a test box and then do a DBCC, and I'm not saying not to do that, but just keep in mind that when it does the physical disk checks for physical consistency and physical errors, that 
that is not going to give you a true result of your production box. But all the logical stuff, so like if I have database corruption in a particular page for a logical consistency error, it will catch that. So it's still worth doing that, but you maybe want to look at doing that on a more frequent basis and then doing your um, DBCCs on your production one. There's also a DBCC option for, uh, it's called physical only. So on your production box, what you may want to do is you could, you could do your DBCCs on your secondaries or restore to a test box. Do a full DBCC uh, or you can do a logical check only if you want and that will give you a good answer there and then you go back on your production box and do a physical only. That way it's not quite as heavy handed uh, running that workload and it'll just do physical checks because you've already checked the logical somewhere else and then you check just the physical piece but I would still encourage you to check the physical piece for sure. Um, here's one from my colleague Brian and I, I wanted to mention his name because he was nice enough to send a question here and his question is how do you handle synchronous system databases in a DR setup? Uh, so that that all depends and it, it um, most of the time in a DR setup, it depends on, I know everybody hates the word it depends, but honestly it depends isn't bad as long as you know what it depends on. It depends on these factors, how busy your database is and how many transactions you're shoving over the wire at any given time. And it depends obviously on what your network throughput is and how far apart you are. So you could do synchronous between data centers so long as you're able to go fast enough to keep up with the amount of transactions that you're putting through. But that's something you're going to have to monitor to see whether it can keep up. If that's the case, then in a DR scenario, you can absolutely do synchronous. Most of the time, uh, after you start getting a decent distance apart and those types of things, you're probably going to be forced to do asynchronous. Um, I know for me, out of my production systems, I've got some that are sync and I've got some that are async for my DR pieces. And that's just because one of them can keep up and one of them can't. So you just need to check that latency to see whether it'll actually work or not. I'm test, test, test. One more question and, uh, because they're flooding in and I'll email Ryan some of these questions and we'll get back to you, I'm sure. Uh, but this is a great question here and it's one on my mind too. You know, with always on, it doesn't keep the logins in sync. I, I know unless your database is, um, um, God, I'm going blank, but you can set your database in contain mode. Um, how do you handle the syncing the logins? So, like on the primary database, you know, you got new people coming in, and you know, you got maybe you have mismatched SIDs if that, or, or you know, whatever the case might be. How are you handling, you know, your logins amongst the different replicas? Right, and that's a great question. So you got to remember with an availability group. Now, this doesn't apply to an FCI, but with an availability group, anything that's at a server level, which also includes things like link servers and those types of things, you've got to make sure that you replicate and duplicate those on all of your secondaries. So I will tell you the easy answer to what I do for mine is I stole it from somebody else, and here's why. I started to write my own script to handle all that stuff for me, and I got about 95% done, and I was having a real hard time handling SQL Server logins. Windows logins are no big deal, but with SQL Server logins, you've got passwords and you've got SIDs, and they're all encrypted, and so they're not so easy to deal with. And I started looking around, and I was almost done, and I went to Robert Davis and said, hey, uh, he goes to SQL Soldier. Uh, online, that's his blog and his Twitter handle, I said, hey, how, how are you doing? I need some help with this. I can't get this last piece done. He goes, oh, I've already written something for that. And he had published it on his blog. And he did some cool stuff with XML that I had never thought to do. His was much shorter and more elegant than mine. So finishing the last 5% of mine became pointless, and I use his now. So if you go to SeawolSoldier.com, or even if you go to my blog, I actually wrote a blog post about my thought process of how I was building it, and then I linked to his. I actually use his, and I use it in production, um, in most of my production environments, because it does a great job of syncing all the logins over. Uh, you know, run it once a day. Uh, it takes care of the roles and how they're mapped to roles and all that kind of good stuff. And, and uh, I haven't had a single issue with it. It runs really, really well. Well, that's great. I mean, that's that's awesome because I'm, I'm gonna go look. I mean, this is great. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for coming on today. I mean, I can't thank you enough. And um. I'm going to say to everyone, this is a session that we record, and y'all can all go to um, the Data Architectures 
and see a recording. And I have it all posted on my blog at uh, sequeltigers.com. You can view it there, the links. And um, I'm going to try to get uh, Ryan back on in a, maybe a month or two or whenever he has free time to do a follow-up session because I think this is great, great stuff. Um, um, thank you, Ryan. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, no, I would be happy to do that. Um, and if, if uh, you're able to get all of the questions uh, out of GoToWebinar, I know you can. Um, if you shoot those over to me, um, I will blog that, uh, every question, and I'll answer them all, and I'll put that in a blog post, and I'll send it to you. That way you can send it out to, to all the members and uh, of the group here to your list, and everybody can go get the answer to their questions and uh, the answer to everybody else's question too, right? I think that's great. So um, I'll get you a copy later today, tomorrow. And we'll get that going. And I'll, I'll be back in touch with you, and we'll have another session when you when you have some time in the next few months. So um, I, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, it's always great to have a great attendance, and I uh, uh, can't thank you all enough for coming. Um, that's it. Yeah. So. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. We'll right. see you sometime in the future. Okay, bye.